Welcome in. Today I am so excited because I have with me Craig Schultz, whose father actually gave us all these little kids behind me. I grew up with the Peanuts kids and Craig, I am so grateful that you're here because you're kind of like their brother in a way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love the I love the background. They all look very happy. Oh, they are, but you notice Franklin is missing because every time I go to the store, he sold out. So if you happen to have a Franklin that you can send me, I, I'd appreciate it because these little guys here would love to have him join the group. Yeah, sadly, I, I sold out too. I couldn't find one myself. But You uh, can't either. Okay. They're, they're, it, it, he, he's so popular. And let's get into that because you are keeping your father's legacy alive with the, with the Apple TV shows and the movies at... I'm so grateful. I know all Peanuts fans are very grateful for that. The latest um, Apple film is Welcome Home, Franklin. And that's probably why he's all sold out because everybody wants him because he's so sweet. Uh, you, everyone that you do, the late lately, the ones that you do, you did Marcy. Uh -huh. And we, you gave us more background and more insight into their personalities. Um, how do you pick the ones that, uh, the stories that you want to tell? Well, we started with the premise that we wanted to do stories similar to what my dad did with the comic strip. You know, the kids could enjoy them, but they really weren't written for adults. And the films we created on Snoopy Presents um, are all basically meant to be watched with a parent and a child. And at the end of the special, <clears throat> they should lead to some kind of conversation. You know, we touched upon the environment with Sally. We touched upon teachers with Lucy. And then we started getting into more character development, which are the ones that I think are really fun to do. So, you know, we explored Marcy and now we get a chance to do Franklin. And Franklin is the one we were wanting to do for a, a long, long time. We just weren't quite sure how to handle it. So that's why we pushed them down the schedule. The last shows we were going to do. I have to say that it, it it's, I, I enjoy seeing more about the individuals instead of the groups and individuals. And um, with the peppermint patty, the the two mom and dad with love, we learn about why and how she became such a tomboy. But she has such a heart to her. <laughs> yeah. So you're you're bring, really bringing them um, additional aspects that we we haven't heard about before. No, that was that was one of my favorites too. Uh, peppermint patty is always fun to work with. Um, you know, Franklin is really one of the most popular characters in the comic strip, surprisingly, or, or maybe not surprisingly, you know, so people were always wanting to know more about Franklin and his backstory <clears throat> was never really told. So we took the premise from the 1968 comic strip where Eric Glickman had told my dad to put a black character in the comic strip. And then we built upon that by going backwards and see where Franklin comes from and how he comes into the neighborhood and meets up with this crazy gang of characters and somehow he's got to blend in with them <laughs> okay yeah well yeah were the blueprints um basically set out by your dad originally about these characters and he just never got to them or are you just expanding on your own premise of what he would have actually wanted you to do with them well no we hypothesized to a certain extent but uh in in most cases we go back to our bible which is the comic strip and if you mind the comic strip you get little hints of of where the characters come from and where their backgrounds are. And, and we kind of build upon that. Uh, you know, for example, most, most people didn't know that Charlie Brown's dad was in the military. You know, Franklin tells him that, you know, his dad was in the military and Charlie says, my dad was too. And we see how they bond. And, and that's kind of the cool thing is, not, is seeing how these two kids that really don't know each other come together and the way children bond as opposed to the way adults bond. I always say when adults get together in a room, Invariably, the adults talk about their accomplishment, what their job is, what titles they won, what, what's the latest golf tournament they won. You take the same conversation with children, and they connect on a different level. It's more of a, an emotional level, more of what I call an, an authentic level, you know, who they really are. And that's what we see in this comic strip, that you have this Black kid from the inner city meeting this brown-headed kid from his crazy town, and somehow they bond to become best friends. Um. You know, I I grew up with them all, and my my bedroom was filled with peanuts of all kinds. And then, actually, when I was about ten years old, I insisted when we were in New York that we go see the the Off Broadway show. You're a good man, Charlie yeah. Brown. I I dragged my parents to that. But I, you know, there's there's some characters from the past, like Violet and Patty, not Peppermint Patty, but Patty, 
and Frida that are basically second tier Peanuts characters to today's world. Are you planning on bringing them more to the forefront or are they, are they this group here the ones that you really want to focus on? I love that you brought that up because obviously you've read the comic strip and <laughs> go back. Every and one of them. <laughs> I think what really happened in my dad's mind is that initially, if you go back to the early days, you'll find out that really <clears throat> Violet and Patty were the ones who were mean to Charlie Brown the most. Mm -hmm. And Lucy, kind of, Lucy grew up. She kind of took over that role. And my dad pushed those characters to the side. Most of those characters in real life were friends of my dad. You know, Shermie, Violet, Frida, Lucy, they were all friends of his from the art instruction school. And he built upon them into the comic strip. But some... I think some just didn't work out in the longevity of the comic strip and they kind of came and went. Uh, the most classic one was Charlotte Braun, which was a character that did nothing but scream. And my dad had her in there for like about a month and somebody got frustrated with her. Yeah. And that's <laughs> saying, I've taken her out. I, I, I miss Violet. I really do. I like Violet. Yeah, we always try to put, I always try to put those two in because Violet and Patty kind of work together. Whenever mm -hmm. you see the strip, you always see that Violet will say one line and Patty will follow it up with another line. So they're kind of a tag team thing, um, kind of taken off the old great comedians from from the past, you know, and uh, I like to play off that. So I think in most of the specials, you'll see they, they're, they are there and they will have that bantering conversation, but Lucy kind of dominates the aggressive kind of mean attitude, I guess. She's good at it. She is good. She's so cute. She's so you gotta love her anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. She's sweet in the end. I mean, she's violent, but she's she always goes back to the soft side. Did I don't recall, did she, Charlie Brown ever kick the football or he still has yet to do that? He still has yet to do that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Poor <laughs> little never, guy. Never <laughs> okay. that, football, that poor kid. Um, okay, so like I said before, my room was completely dedicated. I was a peanuts nut, uh, no no pun intended. Uh, <laughs> was your house filled with peanuts memorabilia? Did you grow up with them all around you? Not really. It's kind of funny because, I mean, I grew up in the 1960s, and that's kind of when licensing really first started taking off. So the first products I remember were the Hungerford dolls. And they were the plastic dolls with a hole in the head. And we used to use those in the swimming pool and we would squirt each other with them because you squeeze, you'd fill up the water and squirt the other kids with them. But by the time it really took off in the, you know, the late sixties, I was already in high school and I'd kind of gone off to riding dirt bikes and I became the official pig pen of the family. Oh, speaking of pig pen, he at one time was my favorite. So I did, when we went to pick out a purchase of, of a of a pendant pig pen was number one so I got pig pen we have to you have to do I'm just telling you what you have to do you have, you have to write another uh show featuring pig pen because he's a sweetheart oh, it's, yeah it's funny because uh, both myself and the director Raymond Percy we both want to do a pig pen special and, and I've drafted one and with my son and we hope to get Apple to buy into that and, and do one they're a little sensitive to kind of the lower level characters but Pigpen is a lot like Franklin, that he's a really um, well-grounded character, no pun intended. He really has no flaws other than the fact that he's dirty, and he's very happy with his his, his filthiness. He has no problem with it. He accepts it, and he's, and he's who he is. And Franklin's a lot the same way. You know, he's a well-grounded character, even-tempered, very intellectual, and uh, doesn't have any of the weird quirks that the rest of the gang do. Right. Well, Pigpen just accepts, accepts himself and expects others to just, hey, yeah, this is me. Love me or leave me, but he's he's adorable. I love him. Yeah. And um, who else haven't we done? Well, you know, Schroeder. You haven't done much with Schroeder lately. <clears throat> and and that's another show we've drafted. We drafted that and turned it into Apple, and and they turned it down at this point. And we hope if we go into a season three, they will. Because I, I'm with you. I really like showing the audience a little more vast as to what the characters are about. Mm -hmm read the comic strip you get a general sense but there's only so much content in the in the comic strip until you see them in animation where they're moving and you literally get to see their expressions you can feel you can feel the pain and the suffering from animation you can't necessarily see in the comic strip so yeah we have done a we did a, what i thought was a really good schroeder special and we hope to get it on the air later on i hope so too because uh, he was actually at one point besides pig pen the schroeder my room was schroeder everything was because i was taking piano lessons and it was schroeder um sally i think has always been one of my favorites too because she's just so kind she's just such a sweetheart 
You know, she has a sweet babu and her big brother. Rerun, that's the other one I was going to ask you about. Are you going to be bringing Rerun into the forefront? Probably not. My, I think after my dad did Rerun for a while, he kind of kind of felt that they, he'd kind of run out of his time. There wasn't too much he could do with the Rerun. And people were confused between looking at Rerun and Linus. Um, just visually, they were a little confusing to see when, when you put them in animation. Um, so he was, you know, he's kind of down on her list. Um, mm -hmm. You can only do so much with a kid that rides on the back of a bicycle. <laughs> yeah, but he sure has some fun experiences. Um, let me ask you about the new, there's a new Apple feature film coming up. That's true. Can you give us a little insight as to what's going to happen in there? Well, Apple has told me not to say anything about it. All I can say is I'm really excited about it because, you know, in the first movie, <clears throat> We really had to set the foundation for the ones we wanted to do next. So in the first one, we kind of set all the goals that the Peanuts audience was going to, going to want to see. The classic scenes of kite flying and football and the music and so forth. In, in this story, we really fixate more on, on one character. I will say we do introduce two new characters, which is exciting. Um, they are kind of B-level characters, but they do. They are main characters in this story. And it's very exciting to write to this story. It's the very emotional story. I think you're gonna, you're definitely gonna cry. You're gonna laugh a lot of it. And uh, it, it's, it's really, we're really, really excited about this one. I want more of this. I mean, this, this little guy up there, Franklin. He, he just, um, I got to learn more about him. I'm, I'm sure everybody learned more about him. And, and that's what's so great about these, these little um, films that you do put out on Apple is. Uh, delving into the personalities and my girlfriend and I watched the um, to mom and dad with love and she cried basically because poor little peppermint patty doesn't have a mother so yeah that was a sad one that was that was very sad and Marcy I I kind of was like Marcy when I was younger at the glasses and I was an introvert but and I could feel for her so I think there's something in each of these characters that somebody can grasp onto and see themselves. Well, that's that's exactly right. And and that's why I think Penis has gone on for as far as it has, has. And I think it will go on forever just because everybody can relate to one or more of the characters. My dad always said, if you read the comic strip, you know who I am. Because really, his personality was built up as a piece of all those characters with uh, Snoopy kind of being the person he wanted to be and Charlie Brown being, unfortunately, the person he was. <laughs> <That's how> he <laughs> Oh, he summed it up. But yeah, I, th I think a lot of us can relate to any number of those characters. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you saw the one with Sally, where Sally was on the mound protecting On the mound. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, to me, that's one of my all-time favorites. And and uh, it's a good commentary on the environment and how, you know, one small person can make a difference. Yeah, she she is a sweetheart. That's what I, I always say. Sally is, is just, her, her heart is so big. She's such a, such a doll. Um, uh, I was going to ask you about how many how, how many siblings do you have, by the way? I have, well, there's five in the family. Did but, your dad take things from you that you've said, you guys have said, or have relayed to him and use them in the strip, in the strip during the years? Well, he always said, and I used to sit at the coffee table at the warm puppy with him and someone, people in Vary would come and say, hey, Sparky, I got an idea for a comic strip. And he would always say, don't tell me because I can't use it. He wouldn't use anybody's suggestions. Mm -hmm. But you know, looking back on our childhood, obviously he was influenced, you know, through the middle 60s, I guess I would say, when the kids were growing up and they saw us doing all these stupid things. I was credited with doing one comic strip. And my sister was credited with doing one comic strip. I will tell you, this this kind of goes back to me being pig pen. My dad walked in my bathroom one night and I was cleaning my hands up after working on my motorcycle or some, something. And he goes, how'd you get your hands so clean? And I reached down and picked up the Crest toothpaste tube and I said, toothpaste. And he used that in the comic strip. I think Lucy comes in and talks to Linus about it. And then my sister was credited with the one where, where she says, did you know if you put your hands upside down, you get the opposite of what you pray for? <laughs> Which, which is kind of a funny thing, but he, yeah, he, he didn't use much of our verbal stuff. He would definitely look at what we did, you know, visually mm -hmm. in the comic strip. Well, did you did you feel drawn to? Did you feel an obligation to continue the legacy because you are it's on your shoulders basically, Peanuts Legacy? Do Do you feel uh, that you were called on to keep that alive? 
Well, I don't know if I was called on. I would say that <clears throat> I'm the only one that still lives in Santa Rosa where our offices were. And after he passed in 2000, and I, th I felt we needed some kind of leadership. He had hired Paige Braddock on in 2000. She had only worked for us for like six months before he died. So I think between myself and his widow, Jeannie, you know, we kind of took the roles of overseeing the peanuts business. And the family, it's funny because the family had agreed to never do a movie. We weren't going to let anybody, you know, we, we moved to a movie. We thought the risk in doing one was not going to be worthwhile, the, the little reward it might happen. And as years went by, I, I realized that, you know, the computers coming online, kids weren't reading, that we needed something to draw the generation, the new generation back to the comic strip. And that's when the idea for the movie came out, which was a really tough sell to the family members. But I finally did. We created it. They all loved it. And, you know, then I think they grew faith in myself and my son as writers for doing this content. He, my son was a screenwriter anyhow, him and Neil Liliano. Um, I just got to join them in creating these other specials. But I think it's been I think it's been really successful. I think the animation that Apple has done and the Snoopy show and Snoopy in Space and then again, these GoView specials have really drawn people back to the comic strip because it seems more popular than ever. Yes, and you mentioned that you're up in Santa Rosa. That's where the museum is. Can you, I've never, I, I can't wait to get up there one of these days. What, oh, yeah. yeah, what do people see? What can you experience at the museum? Well, I think the coolest thing about the museum, <clears throat> and this goes back to my dad and comic strip, when you draw a comic strip, you know, the panels are like eight inches by eight inches. It's, my dad hand drew everything, every comic strip, lettered every single comic strip. And then it got sent to the newspapers and they took that thing, they shrunk it down to one inch by one inch. They put it on the lowest grade paper you could ever imagine. And that's how the average audience saw them. You know, you come to the museum, you actually get to see the original comic strips he drew. We have a rotation that changes every month or so. They change all these comic strips out. There's a lot of history there on his days in the war. Um, we have an exhibit that Christo did where he wrapped the doghouse and, uh, you know, the exhibits change about every four months. We have tremendous designers that come in and create these exhibits um, that are fantastic to watch. I don't get there enough myself and I'm, you know, 40 minutes away from it, but uh, it, it's, it's a must see thing. It's people enjoy it. It's beautifully constructed and a lot to see. Yes. Like I said, I, I cannot wait to get up there. Um, obviously I hope you have a store that we can purchase things there because Maybe maybe Franklin will be up there. I don't know. I we 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 went specifically because I I've been looking for the Franklin to join the group here for ages. And every time uh, I happen to go near um, Nosberry Farm, they're always sold out. That's funny because I didn't envy the other day when somebody had a Franklin and Charlie Brown and they were banging them together. But now if you come up, we have not only the museum, but right next door is the ice arena that my dad and my mom built, and then next to that is the gift shop. So the gift shop is where you're going to want to go and, and you can pick up all sorts of good peanut stuff there. Um, and lots that I don't have. I probably have most of them. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's a, it's a must. It's, it's really a big campus. So you have to visit the whole campus, but give yourself time because you'll want to spend a lot of time in the museum. There's, there's a lot to see. Okay. Um, you know, this is, this is, I don't want to put you on the spot, but in a couple words or a phrase, can you, um, Give us the personality, your view of the personality of some of these characters, like Charlie Brown. How would you just describe him to somebody who did not know anything about him? Well, I think it depends whether you look at him through his own eyes versus the other characters' eyes. I mean, Charlie Brown's one of those characters, the number one will never give up. And that's why he keeps trying to kick the football. He, he's lost a thousand checker games to Lucy. He's going to continue to keep trying to beat her in checkers. But I think it's an all around nice kid. If you moved into a neighborhood, this is what I was going to say for most kids and even myself, if you wanted to move into a neighborhood, <clears throat> I think the penis neighborhood is the place you would want to go because all these kids, as crazy as they are on the, on the outside with Linus carrying a blanket and Lucy with psychiatric booth, they really are a bunch of good kids. They all get along in the end. They all get along and it feels like a really safe neighborhood. Um, it's a place I would want to grow up and you know my neighborhood kind of felt like they neighborhood growing up you know we had our crazy kids like, I think every neighborhood has crazy kids um, but yeah. I think that's Charlie Brown's personality he's he's a kid that you would like to have as a best friend well and Franklin uh, moved into that neighborhood recently on on the show and he and Charlie Brown just hit it off so exactly what you just said um, Sally, now <laughs> she's got, she's got a big brother and she's got a sweet baboo. 
how how do how did your dad pair them up, Sally and Linus? What was that? What was the impetus to put those two together? Well, the, and the term "sweet baboo" came to what a term my dad or what Jeannie used to call my dad. She called him a "sweet baboo," and oh, then he, sweet. Well, he incorporated that into the comic strip. But I think when you look at the comic strip, it's funny because each of the characters has a certain love. You know, <clears throat> you got Lucy that loves <clears throat> Schroeder. And Linus loves his blanket, and Schroeder loves the piano, and Charlie Brown loves baseball, and 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 Pepper and Patty and Marcy both love Charlie Brown. So, and and again, Sally loves Linus. So they all have these this this bottom line of senses that there is love that runs throughout this whole universe, and they all have whoever they love. Unfortunately, their love is is pretty much unrequited in almost all the cases, and and that's where I think that's where my dad had the fun to do it. Yes. And I, you know what, I hope, I hope you never, they never do anything with them growing up because I, I, I just love keeping them the ages that they are. Uh, you know, some strips, they grow up, they did that with, uh, what was it Pebbles and Bam Bam, they made them older and that's kind of rude to, for them. Do you have any manifesto that you're keeping them as is? Oh yeah. Yeah. That's why <clears throat> that was one of the joys of bringing my son on board this project's um, doing the animation because he understands now kind of the legacy of my dad better than he I think he ever did before. And, you know, we've agreed as kind of a unit in Santa Rosa that we kind of lock at least the animation stuff between, you know, the mid sixties to the 1980s. And then there we've, we've locked them in there. You'll never see them use iPads and never have, you know, <clears throat> iPhones, any of that modern technology. It, it's fun to, it's fun to work with the old stuff. And I think the audience really enjoys it. Especially like in parents, you know, when they see their kids and they see them use the dial phone, you can ask their kids, you know what that is? Or when she was up typing something on the doghouse, you know, some of the kids don't even know what a typewriter even is. So it kind of leads to a kind of interesting, fun conversations. But no, <clears throat> they will never grow up. That is is not in our DNA. Oh, that's fabulous. That's fabulous. Speaking of the doghouse, um, we're getting towards the end here, but Snoopy flies, he writes, he's a World War One ace pilot. How did that all come about? How you know, because you you don't even think of a of a beagle doing having this imagination and doing all this. Um, what brought that about? Well, I think my dad always told me it goes back to the time when he was sitting and I was sitting at the kitchen table, I guess, and he looked down. We had a lot of dogs growing up. So you look down at the dog and the dog's looking up at him and he, and he just starts thinking to himself, I wonder what that dog is thinking. And just from that impetus of an idea, he took that in the comic strip and started, you know, making Snoopy have these personas. You know, this is what the dog is thinking. The kids don't know what the dog's thinking. They just think he's a crazy dog. But in Snoopy's mind, he's got all these great thoughts that are going on. And one of his greatest ideas was really <clears throat> the idea of Snoopy chasing the Red Baron. And that came about from my brother and I making World War I model airplanes and running around the house, flying them and battling them and everything. And, and then my dad got the idea of my brother still creates to take credit for of giving my dad the idea of Snoopy taking on the Red Baron. My dad has kind of given in to Monty arguing that for years and years and years. But uh, I think my dad came up with the idea and, and put him on the doghouse. And, and, it, and then once Bill Melendez got Snoopy to fly in uh, one of the specials, then, then, then it really took off. Well, the actually, actually, and, and speaking of, of that, of those, uh, the music is da 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 da. da. I mean, everybody knows that's a penis music. And excuse my singing, me <laughs> because I don't do it well. But um, it's so iconic. The um, Charlie Brown Christmas. Did you did your did anybody expect that to be as popular and as everlasting, evergreen as it as it is? <laughs> no, not at all. John Brown Christmas, when that came out, was supposed to be a disaster. C CBS said, well, CBS felt they got forced into showing it because they had already put the title in the TV guide and, and they couldn't back out at that point. So they'd call my dad and say, well, we really don't want to show this thing. It's too slow. We don't like the music. We don't like, there's no laugh track, but we're going to show it anyhow. And uh, then they showed it and and, uh, and and it obviously took off. You know, it was, it was a vision of my dad to put in the speech from the Bible and, and all the content he did. And, and it's interesting because the pacing of Charlie Brown Christmas has continued through our spacing. 
I kept telling the director, I said, you know, you got to slow everything down. Let everything breathe. You want to feel the emotion these characters are going through, whether it be Sally or Pepper and Patty, or in this case, Franklin. And he really saw that. And he and he passed that on to the actors when they were doing all these shows. Now, he, he understands that it's one of the few animation specials these days that is not just rapid fire, cut, 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 you know, in all this action, action, action. Well, that has uh, lasted for so long. And also uh, the the Great Pumpkin. I I think there's a lot of people, my generation, uh, that pass, pass a pumpkin patch and, and automatically think of the Great Pumpkin coming. And, it, and, and Linus sitting there waiting for him. Uh, these shows are, are just part of our culture now. They're, they have just Snoo uh, Snoopy, uh, Everybody, all the penis gang and their stories are part of our lives. And they have been, they've, they've been the backdrop for so many generations. You must feel really lucky. Well, I do for a lot of respects. And, and yeah, a lot of language my dad created is, is lexicon. It's in the dictionary now, some of those terms, you know, and uh, it, it's pretty impressive. And, and he always said the whole thing about legacies is that legacies are only good if it goes, if it passes through a couple of generations. And, you know, I think without a doubt, his legacy is going to continue for many, 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 many generations. And my hope is my, myself and my son and our team in Santa Rosa will continue to keep peanuts on track and not let anybody come in and mess it up. Oh, yes, definitely. That's that's what we all want. That's what we want. But we, we have Blockhead, um, Good Grief. Uh, <laughs> there's so many quotes from these guys that are part of our lives. And uh, it's so much fun to have the Peanuts gang in our lives. And like I said, I, at 10 years old, I, I dragged my parents to your good man, Charlie Brown, because Peanuts, there's something about them, the kids that everybody likes of all ages. Is they're, not, they're not just meant for, for little kids. They're not just meant for teenage, they're, they're meant for the whole gambit of ages. And we've all grown up with them and we've all loved them. Well, exactly. And I think our generation really learned how to read, you know, literally how to read by reading comic strips, whether it be Peanuts or anything else. But I think what you learned emotionally from reading Peanuts was much greater than what you would have gotten out of Dennis the Menace or some of the other comic strips. I mean, there were some deep messages in there. And the fun thing is for me, when I go back to do research, I look at those comic strips that I laughed at when I was a kid. And as an adult, they take on a totally different meaning that you didn't even recognize when you read it as a child. Right. Well, I have the book of every Peanuts strip ever written <laughs> that's ever published. I have all the DVDs. I am a true Peanuts fanatic. And <laughs> um, these little guys are are my buddies. And um, I'm going to keep looking for Franklin because he's got to join the group. He really has. <laughs> you can keep looking. He's out there somewhere. He's hiding yeah. from you. I think you can find him if you keep looking. I'll keep looking. I'll keep looking. And uh, maybe one day you'll have a uh, a regular patty and a violet come out as well. <laughs> I don't know, there's something about violet that I just automatically I was drawn to. She was so, so interesting character. <laughs> See, there you go. Everybody's got a character to connect with me. Me, it's Pig Ben. You, it's Violet. Maybe Patty. Well, Pig Ben too. I mean, I think I, I there's something about Pig Ben that y'all have to love. You gotta. I, I wouldn't mind. I hate dust, but I wouldn't mind being near him. <laughs> Well, thank you. We are out of time, but I really do appreciate you um, coming on. Talk to us about the Peanuts legacy and what we can expect in the future. And hopefully you'll get those two greenlit from Apple. Um, and then we've got the movie coming out in a couple of years. So we have a lot to look forward to. And currently running on Apple TV is Welcome Home, Franklin. Um uh, let's see what's it uh one of kind marcy lucy school well she, she's a know-it-all <laughs> to mom and dad with love um it's a small things charlie brown they're all up on apple tv plus so check them out and uh i just they just transcend generations so thank you craig so much for carrying on your dad's legacy thank you it's been a pleasure talking to you and maybe we will see you again when the next movie comes out I hope so. Nope. I hope so. <laughs> okay. For the viewers, thank you. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.
With over 30 years of experience in real estate in the mortgage industry, Darlene Mays provides knowledge and expert guidance to clients looking to buy or sell a home. Serving clients throughout South Orange County, Darlene specializes in the senior community of Laguna Woods Village. Darlene works with her clients to ensure the highest level of service, from the beginning of the process right down to the closing table. If you are looking to buy or sell, who you work with really does matter. Call Darlene Mays today.